Well, today is uh, Wednesday, uh, May the 13th. We'll continue here in the Minor Prophets, and especially in the book of Micah. And uh, we have uh, been doing this now for several weeks. We're in chapter 3. And when you think about the, the name Micah, it means uh, who is like Jehovah. He was from uh, Moresheth. It says here on uh, Jeremiah 26, verse 18, uh, Micah from Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, a king of Judah. He told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Zion will be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, and the uh, temple a hill of a mound of overgrown, overgrown with the thickets. And so he has a message of doom uh, to Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Now, uh, Micah was from the town of Moresheth, as I said, Moresheth Gath, and you see on the map here, Israel to the north and Judah to the south, and uh, Moresheth Gath was about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem, uh, closer to the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and he was from a small town, but still he was uh, concerned about the social ills of his day, and especially as they affected uh, his homeland. So he has a, a vital stake in the message he's going to present to his people, because they're, they're his people and, and his land. Now, the message uh, really alternates between uh, messages of doom and messages of, of hope, uh, God's sternness and also God's kindness. And so when you think about the uh, main message, it is the divine judgment and then also deliverance. So it's a good thing to know that uh, when the prophet uh, prophesies uh, judgment, he's also prophesying, prophesying uh, God's goodness and uh, the people's de uh, deliverance. So uh, just as you and I now here in the New Testament age, uh, we realize that sin is uh, something we should uh, not be a part of. We're all sinners by birth, by nature, and by choice, but also we're glad that uh, Jesus Christ provides deliver deliverance and, and forgiveness of sin. So uh, very similar to the message of Micah, he has a, mes a message of judgment, but also a message of deliverance. Now, he stresses these things here concerning uh, the nation of Israel, and especially the, the southern area, uh, Jerusalem area, uh, idolatry and injustice, rebellion and empty ritualism, uh, but also the fact that God delights in uh, repentance of, the, of his people. Now, when we go through the uh, book of Micah here, and as, especially as we're going through uh, the coronavirus here in the United States of America and around the world, uh, we can understand that uh, what Micah is saying about the people of his day really does apply to the people of our day. There is corruption, there is idolatry and inju injustice and, and rebellion, even in our day in, uh, in places, people in, in high places. So uh, nothing has changed much as far as human nature is concerned. Then the prophet declares Zion will have a greater glory in the future than ever before as he uh, expounds upon the, the kingdom of David and the coming Messiah that will uh, come uh, soon. We don't know when, but uh, it's prophesied, and he will come soon. So now also when you think about the book of Micah, it's really in three strains or three uh, sections or three parts. We've covered the first part, which is in chapter 1, verses 1, through uh, chapter 2, verse 13. And now we're in chapter 3, and this is the start of the, the second strain or the second section of the book of Micah. Now, the overview of chapter 3, uh, in verses 1 through 4, uh, we see where the prophets, the, the, the prophet reproves and threatens both the princes and the prophets, uh, first separately and then together, uh, first the heads of the, of the princes of the people and then the civil magistrates uh, for their ignorance of justice, their hatred of good, and their love of evil, and for their oppression and, and cruelty. Also, uh, they are threatened with distress when they should be crying out to the Lord. And of which, will, which has not heard them. So uh, that's in verses 1 through 4. Then in verses 5 through 7, we, we've covered uh, verses five, 1 through 6 uh, last week, so we'll uh, cover the rest of the chapter today. Next, the prophets are taken to task, and uh, they're taken for their eagerness in pursuing uh, evil and lying and false prophesying, and they're threatened with darkness and want of vision and for an answer from the Lord, and, and with shame and confusion. So uh, divine judgment will come upon those who have been the prophets and have prophesied uh, wrongly to the nation of Israel. And then in verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8, the, the prophet is full of the Spirit of God, the power of God, to declare the sins and transgressions of Jacob in, in Israel. You think about uh, the man Micah, and he certainly had to be uh, controlled and led by uh, the Spirit of God as he heralded uh, divine judgment. It, it, it took a man of a great courage and great strength, and Micah was that man, and God had uh, worked through his heart and life uh, to uh, give him that power. Then uh, verses 9 through 11, 
uh, very freely uh, proclaim princes and priests and prophets all together. Uh, although they were guilty of very notorious crimes, yet in their mind they thought they were in great security and promised themselves impunity. They thought they could get away with all of their evilness, but uh, God has another plan uh, for their uh, situation. Then we end in verse 12 and it says, Wherefore the city and the temple of Jerusalem are threatened with an, with an utter, utter desolation, and that certainly uh, does come. Now we've uh, covered verses 1 through uh, 6. So actually, we'll, we'll go on and we'll review verse 6 tonight and go from 6 down to verse 12 as we finish out chapter uh, 3 here in the, in the book of Micah. Now again, I'm taking each, uh, each section or each verse and each section of the verse and uh, putting them on the screen and giving to you uh, what this might mean and what the prophet was, was saying uh, to the people. So we, we recap here, verse six, verse 6, it says, Therefore a night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision. He has already proclaimed uh, God's divine judgment upon the people, the prophets, the priests, and uh, those in, in great authority. And so now he says, Night shall, shall be upon you and that you shall not have a vision. So what does that mean? So each little section, and we'll explain what that section means. So these men, these false prophets, were, prophets were never sent of God, and they never received any message from him. They thought they did, but they never received any message from him, nor did they have any prophetic talents at all, uh, it, which is the sense what, what Mike is trying to uh, get across. So that such darkness and dreadful calamity should come upon the people in general and upon the prophets in particular. It may be expressed this way. Therefore, night shall be unto you because of vision. A calamity should come upon you because of your false and uh, pretended visions of peace and pro prosperity that you prophesied to deceive uh, God's people. So there's verse 6, a portion of the first portion of verse 6. We go to the second portion of verse 6. It says, And it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not divine. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, uh, such darkness and affliction should be upon them and that they would not offer to deliver uh, out of any divination or prediction of good things coming, coming upon them. Uh, so you know, their, their predictions will not come true is what Micah is trying to say. The sun shall go down, upon, go down over the prophets and the day shall be dark over them. It sounds like a message, message of doom, which it certainly is. Their, their time of prosperity will be over. Uh, all the things that they prophesied, peace and prosperity, uh, it will not be uh, coming to, uh, to pass. And those things that they thought would come to pass will be uh, divine judgment. So uh, their time of prosperity is over and shall no more be in favor with the people uh, as they've courted and feasted them, uh, and they shall be in uttermost contempt and disrespect. So payday someday is going to come. Now we're going to verse 7, uh, the new verse here for tonight on Wednesday, uh, May the 13th. And so we get to this verse says, uh, Then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners con uh, confounded. These prophets shall be ashamed and the ones who have uh, divined uh, false uh, messages, they'll be confounded. Uh, when it's finally revealed that, that all their visions, their divinations, and their prophecies are false, uh, they will not be able to lift up their heads. They'll be uh, much in shame, and uh, shame and confusion will, be, will cover them. Uh, certainly when, uh, when we've, our sins are found out, uh, we are ashamed and we're confused, and that's what uh, Micah is prophesying. These false prophets, they'll be ashamed and confused when their uh, false prophecies are uh, discovered. And so there's the first part of verse 7 in chapter 3. Then the second part of verse 7, Yea, they shall cover their lips. You know, they'll, they'll stop their mouth. They'll hold their tongues. They'll be entirely and totally silenced. They'll, be, they'll pretend to, be, to utter uh, any other uh, a vision of prophecy. It won't happen. Uh, nor will they be able to say one word in defense of themselves or what they have uh, before prophesied. So, again, their sins will be found out and they will be put, put to great shame. It says, For there is no answer of God. The uh, last portion there, the second, the portion of verse seven, uh, not that they should be ashamed in silence, because they shall know, know or have no answer of God, for they never had any, and their guilt is now revealed. Uh, their guilt is is pronounced upon them. Micah, again, the prophet who uh, pronounces doom and and uh, divine judgment upon these uh, ones, uh, payday someday has arrived. Now, verse eight, the the uh, the mood the mood changes in verse eight, because here is Micah. And he says, for, but truly I am full of, the power, full, full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And so full of power, even the Spirit of the Lord, you know, these are words of Micah concerning himself in opposition to the false prophets who are destitute of the Spirit of God. Um, certainly, 
We think about our lives today as Christians. You know, the Bible says that our, our, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we should have the answer of God uh, for individuals when they come to us for advice and seek uh, guidance. We need to uh, direct them to the Word of God. And really, that, that's what Micah is doing. He's directing them back to God. And so he has the, uh, the power, of the, uh, power of, the, of the Spirit of God. He is saying here in verse 8, first section, verse 8. It says, and of judgment and of might. He has the power to understand judgment and of might. So uh, judgment of the truth and being able to discern truth and error. That's a, that's a great thing to have, even as a believer in Christ, to know uh, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Uh, John talks about that and over in, uh, in Second John. So uh, we need to understand the spirit of truth and the spirit of error between what comes from the spirit of God and what comes from the lying spirit and the spirit of divination and falsehood. What is, to be prop what is proper and what is spoken at the right time and to whom. So that's what, the, uh, that's what Micah is trying to stress here in this verse. He, he knows uh, proper judgment. He knows uh, proper might. He knows God. He's connected with God, and he, he's the voice of the Lord. So uh, even in today's uh, society, it's a shame that uh, more people do not listen to uh, preachers of God who are walking with God and talk about the message of God, but rather their own uh, particular ways. So uh, you and I, we live in very similar times. Now the, the next section here, verse 8, says, To declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Think about the, the courage this man had to have as he was uh, declaring uh, the sins and the, the transgressions of both Jacob and Israel, you know, uh, Jacob to the, uh, Israel to the north, Jacob to the south. And so uh, here he is. He has great power, and God's hand is, is upon him, just as it was in, with many of the other uh, prophets in the Old Testament, uh, to freely and openly set it before them in the, in the true light and, to, pro and to, re to reprove them for the same and to threaten them with judgments of God in the case they do not repent. So even today, you know, when a pastor stands in a pulpit, and shares the gospel, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and says, you know, God loves you with an everlasting love. The Lord died for you. Jesus died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And uh, you, you and I need to trust him as our Savior. And if we don't, you know, we'll not go to heaven. We'll, we'll end up in, in, in the lake of fire. We'll end up in a place known as hell, a place known as the uh, you know, lake of fire and judgment forever and forever and forever. Well, certainly... That's not a popular message, but uh, the message here that uh, Micah had for uh, the nation of uh, Israel, and uh, he, was, uh, he was the one who had the fire of God upon him and was pronouncing uh, what God was intending to do. Now we go to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel. This would be like, uh, you know, going to the president of the United States, you know, and uh, those who are in charge and listen, listen to what he's saying. Uh, hear this is what I'm saying to you, uh, you men of authority. Uh, as instances of, of his boldness, his courage, and impartiality, he begins with the principal men of the land and charges them with the sins and, re and reproves them and denounces judgments uh, of, on, on account of them. So these men who were in charge, the heads of the house of Jacob, the princes of the house of Israel, these leaders, he is going and basically, you know, shaking his bony finger in front of them, if you will, and tell them, you know, they're sinners and they need to repent of the sins that they've uh, been uh, doing and leading the nation. In. And it says, and it says in the second part here, verse nine, uh, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. You know, if you if you abhor judgment, you hate judgment. Well, a sad character for princes, and rulers, and judges who not only ought to know but to love judgment and justice and, and equity, and to do them, even take delight and pleasure in in them toward everyone. Uh, and in every cause that came before them. But instead, this they hated to do that which was right and just and perverted all the rules and laws of justice, of, uh, of justice and equity and clearing the guilty and condemning the innocent. It sounds like uh, the politics of, of today, doesn't it? You know, as you think about uh, all the corruption, even, even in, in the government here in the United States of America and uh, things that are done that are so improper, things that are done that are so uh, 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 unjust and, and uh, wrong well, it, it, it happened in Micah's day, just like it's happening right now, even in America and literally around the world, because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's uh, verse 9. Now we'll go to verse 10. I know that the Bible study will not be a long thing tonight here. 
Because we're, we're just sort of finishing up uh, chapter 3. But uh, verse 10 says, They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. So what in the world would that mean? Well, what they, they respect the heads and the princes of the people. These are false prophet, prophets who either uh, repaired the temple of Zion or the king's palace or built themselves fine stately houses in Jerusalem. That's what uh, Mike is trying to say. Or large streets or by money they took for, uh, to murder, uh, of murderers to save them. Or by money gotten by oppression, by uh, spoiling the poor uh, of their goods and their livelihood for them and their families, which was all uh, basically as one shedding innocent, innocent blood. Do they literally shed innocent blood? Not literally, but by, by literally starving the people and uh, doing things uh, unjustly is what Mike is trying to say. They build up Jerusalem with, with blood. Uh, it, the blood of these people they have oppressed. And by money they've, they've obtained bribes and perversion of justice. And with, with such illegal proceedings, they, they uh, truly called iniquity. So... Uh, they build up Jerusalem with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Now, the second portion here, uh, next thing I should say, uh, verse 11 is, uh, the heads are of judge uh, for reward. Think about this. The heads are of judge for reward. They do things for monetary gain. Now, it is true, you know, uh, pastors receive a, a salary uh, and a uh, and a payment from uh, you know, from the church, and they, they, the church supports the pastors. But this is a different situation. Uh, that is, the heads of the principal of, of Zion and Jerusalem, the kings of the Sanhedrin, you know, the, these heads of Israel, who went on the same course of, of injustice, giving the cause not right, not on the right side, but to them that gave them the most money, and bribes uh, according contrary to the the law of God. So these men, you know, as you see the picture there. Uh, you know, perhaps money under the table, if you will, is what uh, Mike is trying to say. The heads there have uh, judged for reward or monetary gain. Uh, certainly, uh, this was a, a, an aspect of corruption in the day, and we can see even, even see it done uh, even in uh, America and around the world today, as I said previously. Uh, second uh, portion of verse 11, and the priests there have teach for hire. Uh, though they had the sufficient, sufficient and honorable care provided by the law of God for them, yet uh, not content with this, they took a price uh, of the people for teaching them, you know, taking bribes, if you will. Um, this is nothing new. You know, it happened in Micah's day. It happens now. And uh, what a sad thing it is for those who say they are, you know, men, uh, men and women who uh, proclaim God's word uh, to take uh, money uh, wrongly from people and to lord over people. And the prophets thereof divine for money. Next the section there of this verse. They tell men what, they should, what should befall them, what good things they should be possessed of, what plenty and prosperity they should enjoy. And this they did according to the amount of money given them. Uh, this must be understood of the false prophets. So uh, certainly uh, when you think about corruption and money in, in religion, uh, religion uh, left, by, left to itself and unchecked uh, can be a very profitable thing, and it was for these men, and their sins will soon find them out. Uh, as it is oftentimes even in today with people around the world that uh, make a lot of money and, uh, and uh, prophesy and teach things that are just not according to biblical principles, certainly we need to check out what we hear you know, from teachers on the radio or TV online, uh, wherever we hear these messages, we need to check it out with the Word of God, make sure that what they're saying is absolutely true and, 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 and equals with the Word of God. So, next part of this verse, is that yet will they lean upon the Lord. So, even in their lives, they say, no, no, we're leaning upon the Lord. We, we, you know, we believe that we are in right, in right relationship with God. Well, they lean upon His providence, protection, as if they were filled with the Spirit of God and might securely rely and depend upon them, though by their sins and transgressions they had forfeited all the benefits and privileges thereof. It's like they're standing on the rock, but yet they're not at all standing on the rock. So uh, very, very uh, enlightening when you think about Micah chapter 3. And they say, is, it, is not the Lord among us? You know, uh, how deceived sometimes people are. Uh, even in today's uh, age, you know, people will say they've, they've, say they've said a prayer, if you will. Uh, they've, uh, you know, uh, said the sinner's prayer, and they, they go to back to some experience they have. I call this the, the ghost of experience. Well, if you're self-deceived, uh, that's, the, that's the worst kind of deception there is. And say, is not the Lord among us? 
uh, trust into this, that the temple of the Lord was among them, and the temple of God they were, and the most holy place uh, was there, and these were symbols of divine presence, the ark, the cherubim, the mercy seat. And so uh, concluding all these things, they, they think they're in, in much safety and security. They put their confidence in outward uh, places and things and external worship, sacrifices and rites and ceremonies, and when they neglect the weightier matters of, of law and justice and truth and mercy. Uh, there are people today that are trusting in outward circumstances of their religion uh, to save them, to get them to heaven, just like these men were. And they say, it's not the Lord among us. Well, the answer is no. <laughs> and no, the answer is not, uh, the, 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 the Lord is not among you because you are not connected with him in the first place. None evil can come upon us. Upon us. They say, well, the evil can't come upon us because you know, we're, we're right with God, such as pestilence and famine and sword, captivity. The, the prophets of the Lord had threatened them with. Now, these false prophets said, this can't happen. Uh, no, we're, we're walking with, with, with the Lord, and the evil can't come upon us. No, the prophet Micah said otherwise. He said, yes, divine judgment will come upon you, and will come sharply. Then we get to the last verse, verse 12. It says, therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. What a, what a heart-wrenching uh, word, wording that is, that Zion should be plowed as a field. You know, the, 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 the promised land, the holy land. Uh, that is for your sins, the bloodshed, the injustice, the cruelty of the princes, the priests, the prophets. And not that the common people were free from crimes, but these are particularly mentioned, you know, the, the heads of the state, if you will, the ones that, who were the leaders of the day. As being the ringleaders in the sin, they ought to have set better examples. Well, did this, did this happen? Well, this was fulfilled in part at the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans, when the city was reduced to rubble, uh, reduced to rubble, and uh, more fully when they were destroyed by the Romans and then plowed up, uh, plowed up, uh, uh, as the Jews say, uh, so that there was not a house or a building left upon it, because, and, but it became utterly desolate and, and uninhabited, especially in the uh, reign of Adrian. Now the next section of verse 12, this last verse, and Jerusalem shall uh, become heaps. You know what a what an unusual. Uh, wording that is, Jerusalem shall become heaps. Um, Jerusalem, th that great city that the Jewish people loved and cherished, and, and their homeland, their, their capital, if you will, the one that was uh, the, the prince to them, if you will. Uh, the only, not only the city of David built on Mount Zion should be demolished, but the other part of the city called Jerusalem should be uh, thrown down. Its walls and houses lie in heaps like heaps of stones in the midst of a plowed field. Uh, what an unusual uh, wording that is, but yet, that, did that come true? It certainly did, and God's divine judgment came true upon these people. And so, and it says, and the mountain of the house is the high places of the forest. Here's Mount Moriah, uh, which the prophet is talking about, on which the temple was built, the mountain of the house of the sanctuary, the temple upon it would be destroyed, and not one stone left upon another. Was that fulfilled? Yes, it was. And, and the place of which it stood should be covered with grass and trees, with briars and thorns, as the forest is, and all which have been explicitly fulfilled. And so when God prophesies something through his prophets and heralds something through his word, he means what he says, he says what he means, and it will come true. Now, when we think about uh, the promises of Jesus he said, I will come. And, and yes, uh, Jesus came as a babe and was born in a manger and lived and died, lived here 33 years, died on the cross of Calvary, was buried and rose again the third day, shed his precious blood for our sins, and he went away. He said, I'm going to come again. And we have the words of the Apostle Paul that one day, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he will come back. He said, well, he's not come back in 2,000 years, you know. Uh, you know, uh, is, he, is he going to come back? Yes, he is. Uh, you and I do not know the exact hour, do not know the exact day or time, but yet we can know the times and the seasons, the Bible says. And so uh, even the writer of Hebrews says we're in the last days, and we should be uh, very vigilant in our walk with God. So thank God for his promises. And so this is the last verse of chapter 3. And we'll, uh, again, uh, next Wednesday night, uh, take up with uh, Micah chapter 4. And so let's have a closing word of prayer as we end out chapter 3. Father, thank you for the man Micah, the prophet Micah. Thank you, Father, for the uh, courage and strength you gave him to herald the word of God, a message of uh, uh, doom and a message of, of deliverance. And thank you, Father, that you gave him that strength and that courage. We pray for strength and courage in our day. 
in our, our, our lives. Lord, I stand for that which is true and right and honorable. And uh, Lord, a, a, lo a loving God that loves the people and uh, loves us with an everlasting love, yet who is a God of justice and righteousness and judgment. So Lord, help us to walk with you closely. And Lord, help us to be uh, walking uh, farther and farther away from sin and closer and closer and closer to you. Lord, that our lives will be characterized just like Micah, of the Spirit of God being upon us and the power of God being upon us. Lord, bless our lives as we end up this study tonight in chapter 3. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.